Team, we've got a great conversation here today. Today's podcast is with David Newman. And David is the author of Do It Selling, 77 Instant Action Ideas to Land Better Clients, Bigger Deals, and Higher Fees. David's a professional services sales expert, and he works with leading consultants, coaches, and speakers who want to land better clients, bigger deals, and higher fees. He's got a specific target market. But these 77 instant action ideas are so universal in terms of smart, methodical B2B sales that they're applicable for all sorts of folks listening to our podcast, which is why I was so excited to get them on the podcast. The other thing, it's an extremely well-written book. So these 77 ideas, David's really gone through that effort of making them concise, powerful, leveraging core concepts in B2B sales, and then providing tools you can download to apply the concept. Love the way the book's laid out. It's kind of book gang, by the way, that you're going to leave on your bookshelf and go back to repeatedly because it gets it very specific on things like scripts and ideas and approaches to conversations. Really, really great. One of the things I like so much is David has a a simple clarity to the way he writes and speaks. And in fact, he's got this simple and clear but powerful definition for something like marketing. Four words, offer value, invite engagement. Simple definition of selling, send invitations, spark conversations. Love it. We talk about a couple of different concepts in the book, not all 77, of course, but we do get to first conversations. He's got five tips for first contact calls that are very, very powerful. We get into all of them. We get into the four ways to create follow-up magic. Also very powerful. Just a little bit of a uh, spoiler alert. The first one, always lead off with the prospect's comments from the previous call. Um, David started into this career, you know, after starting in the theater. So we're going to hear a little bit about that journey. Just a super interesting fellow, also the host of his own podcast called The Selling Show. He's got over 400 episodes. So I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation with David Newman. I know I did. And if you do, please like and subscribe to The Selling Well Podcast because A, that really helps us. So thank you for doing that. And B, that's how we get great guests like David. So here he is, David Newman. Enjoy. Hey, David, welcome to the show. I was so excited to talk to you today. Hey, Mark. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So so gang, as you know, we only actually interview the folks who've written books that we really like in, in selling. And David, I got to call this out. There's so many things I like about Do It Selling. Um, The 77 instant action ideas to land better clients, bigger deals, and higher fees that I've already bought Do It Marketing. I haven't got it yet. I just did it this morning, but I've got Do It Marketing coming my way because I'm in your target market, frankly. And a lot of these things are so applicable and I learned many things. But, um, you know, in our quick conversation here, and I had a chance to listen to a few episodes of The Selling Show. I got to ask this question because it seems clear to me that you were a theater and drama major. How does a theater and drama major end up being an expert in selling and professional services and coaching? Oh, man. How much time do we have, Mark? How much time do we have? We might have to go keep it to an hour and a half, and I, (laughs) I think we'll trim it from there. So I did actually start as, actually, I started college pre med. I failed out of chemistry, physics, and calculus all in the same semester. Decided to change my major to drama and English. Uh, Had so much fun doing that that I then went to graduate school and I got an MFA in stage directing. And I I did four years of professional theater in New York City. While that was happening, yeah, so that that was kind of a a crazy episode. But I wasn't making any money because it's really hard to make money in theater in New York City. It's like going to L.A. to be an actor. You end up waiting tables. (laughs) So a friend of mine says, hey, David, there's this... um, adjunct professor thing, this uh, teaching opening, this was a guy who had had the job, he was moving away, would you like to interview for my adjunct faculty position? So I started teaching in my graduate school, did that for a couple of years just to make ends meet. And then another friend says, you know, you could do this teaching thing for companies and that's called corporate training. So in 1992, I launched my corporate training and consulting career That spanned three different jobs. So I did that for 10 years. 
ended up with some HR consulting, management consulting, technology consulting firms. And then dumb as I was in 2002, I said, you know, I can do this on my own. I know how to teach. I know how to train. I know how to consult. How hard can it be? And Mark, right. I found out how hard <laughs> it can be because when you're on your own and you leave the corporate nest, yes. it's about selling the work. It's not about doing the work. So I knew nothing about marketing, sales, lead generation, business development. I was a babe in the woods. I was also a generalist consultant and trainer. So I had like 30 different workshops, 30 different topics. I realized that if I wanted to eat, I needed to learn how to sell. So I read all kinds of books. I connected with mentors. I took courses. I really became a student of the game. Uh, about three or four years into this, I'm like, well, I have no niche. I have no nothing. But the sales thing is pretty cool. This marketing thing is pretty cool. Why don't I teach what I'm learning? Yes. Right? To folks yep. that are three, four years behind where I am. And so that was the whole genesis of how the drama major ended up in a marketing and sales training role. And, and you know, here we are, fast forward, 1,800 clients later, you've worked for some of the largest organizations in the world. And, and team, um, you know, having just finished my first book, David's got three books, Do It Selling, Do It Marketing, Do It Speaking. I, I'm just amazed at a couple of things, David, and I'll just call out for those folks who are going to pick up this book, and you should. Um, first of all, the design and clarity of the book. It's a very good looking book. It's, it's easy to read. Um, I love the fact you don't see a lot of color books out there today. And these things matter. We all, you know, we dream in technicolors. So the book, that's certainly something I'm taking away from myself next time. But, but the way you've laid this out, these short uh, snippets, these action ideas that are very clear, it, it really feels to me like you, you're the example of that Mark Twain quote. Hey, I wrote you a long letter. If I took more time, I would have written you the short letter. Right. You took the time to write the short letter, but but it's really, folks, it's all gold. There, there's no fluff. There's no stories that aren't relevant. There's no filler. And again, on many of these action items, there are tools you can download to actually apply the concept in the book. So a bit of the Bucky Fuller, those of you who are Mensa candidates, I'm pretty sure I'm not, but those of you who are Mensa candidates, remember Bucky Fuller, the founder of Mensa said, if you want to teach someone, don't bother teaching them, show them how to use a tool because that's how you teach them for life. Yeah. And so it's really, really um, just a spectacular read. And, and this is the kind of book, folks, a lot of times when we have guests on the show, David, what I'll do is I'll read the book, I highlight the book, and then I'm going to go back and I'm going to dictate my highlights. So I have a two page summary. So I can go back to it someday because I, I want to retain it really. And I'm not just saying this for the podcast. This is the book that would stay on my shelf because I'm going to go back. There's some things I've picked up here that I think are very helpful, but just this clarity, the, there's a clarity of message was that, you know, obviously it's the way you are. Maybe it comes from the theater background, but did you, was that an intentional focus to make sure it's short, clear, powerful? So thank you for all those amazing compliments. Can I come back on this show like every week? Because this just feels <laughs> yeah, <right>. so amazing. <laughs> all this flood of adulation. <laughs> I really appreciate it. So, you know, I all three of my books are written in this format. I call them micro chapters. And when folks come to me and they say, David, I, I really want to write a book, but I, I don't have time to write. I say, don't worry. They don't have time to read. So right. write short. So if I was to put my whole publishing philosophy into four words, it would be write short, market hard. Write short, nice. market hard. Um, it was, um, I forget, it was, a, it was a book publishing blog that somewhere, this was in the last couple of years, they were saying about short attention spans. Yes. And then everyone wants to write the 50, 60,000 word mega monster business book. And they were saying, if you're sending this to CEOs, if you're sending this to VPs, you're sending this to busy senior corporate leaders, they don't have time. Yeah. So don't write a book, write half a book. That was the advice, write half a book. Yeah. Because they, if they can read the book from a flight from New York to Chicago or New York to 
maybe Phoenix at the most, right? Four, four and a half hours. Uh, two hours and 13 minutes, by the way, is the New York to Chicago flight time. But if they can read it or scan it or skim it and get enough of an idea of your professional expertise in that two hours, because Mark, folks like you and I, we don't get hired based on books that clients do not finish. It's like, right. did you read David's book? Oh, I only got about <laughs> a third of the way through it. And then I put it aside because it was too dense. It was too hard to read. So micro chapters do two things to help experts. I think number one, it really helps to encapsulate your thinking in a very short, sharp little package. It yes. also makes the book more digestible because Mark, I'm sure you read a lot. I, I know I read a lot. We want to have that completion complex, right? We want to have that 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 little happy yes. is going off in our brain with the yeah. um, you know, the the dopamine. Dopamine. Yeah. Oh, I finished another chapter. It's like, well, That's yeah, right. you read a page and a half. So if you right. read a page and a half and you're <laughs> seeing the next chapter right there, you're like, look, I'm making progress. The the best compliment that I got on all three of my books, which is really a backhanded compliment, they said, David. I love your writing style. It's perfect bathroom reading. Right. And I was like, I will take that in the spirit it's intended, my friend. I That's will take right. that in the spirit it's intended. So that was the nature of the micro chapters and the short, sharp, you know, very clear uh, little nuggets that that is the writing style. You, you know what it comes across, by the way. And and but again, we're we're really critical, frankly, or I am. We're critical of sales books. So, oh, so yes. you're right, because of the podcast and because of my nature, I, I've read hundreds and hundreds of sales books. We've had, you know, over a hundred guests on the show and out of consideration, we read the books they write before they come on the show. Um, this is actually, you know, there are some fundamental truths that you've got in here that, that we've heard that people who have lived this life understand but but I think what's super helpful because you've got a very specific target niche that you're trying to support and help, yeah. you know, coaches, consultants, trainers looking to get bigger clients, bigger yeah. deals and higher fees, you, you get very practical. And so, for example, when you're talking about a sales process or a first call with someone, you give very specific examples of here's the four things to do. Here's a couple of turns of phrases you can actually use. So, so to me, team, you know, if you're in that category, first of all, this is the kind of book you can pull away and you will go back to it and you'll start to leverage some of the, I won't call them scripts as much as guides, but they're yeah. very, very logical. And again, you're also referencing some sales fundamentals that are just universal, regardless of who's listening to this podcast. So, yeah. so whether or not you're a trainer or a coach or a consultant, Getting through that first call is really critical. There's a couple of ideas that are very, very powerful in here that I think people can people can take away these tips no matter what they do. Yeah. But but let's chat about it. If you don't mind, we'll jump into a couple, you sure. know, just to, to get right into it. I've got to go just, to- You know, Mark, it's funny. Whenever someone has the book in front of them, there's a little voice in my head going, I hope I remember what I wrote. Exactly. I, I, know. I, I hope I remember what, what, what he's about to call out <laughs> That's here. Right. Cause this is, what you know, that you, you, did you, I throw out? Yeah, exactly. So I, <laughs> like, did I say time, that? Wow. That sounds really smart. You know, it's funny. We, we get, you know, when we're in front of a group of people, every once in a while, there's somebody who's a zealot who's listened to every podcast and they go, Mark, you referenced this data point and this reference point from CSO insights back in 1987. I go, what doesn't even ring a bell. It doesn't even sound like me. But, but I've got to go to, and I'll, I'll give you some context, um, uh, action item uh, number four, do you love selling, of course, was the one that kind of jumped out at me, Oh yes. given the title of our book, yes. Learn to Love Selling. Amen. So do you love selling? So you got to believe in selling, got to understand that people, you know, have some of these challenges. And then I love that just down at the bottom you know, we might be feeling anxious, we might be feeling depressed, we get paralyzed, overwhelmed, mystified. Yeah. But but again, the summary point that says no sales, no clients, no money, no bueno. That's true. So simple. You got to do it. You, you know, as you say, are we going to be the best pizza parlor that's never had somebody come in the front door? Yeah. Or are you dominoes? You know, yeah. to a certain extent. And, and so 
th this is where I think you, it's not just selling expertise that comes from the, the, the book, but there's this expertise you have being a growth oriented entrepreneur. Yes. Right? So there's yeah. so many of those other entrepreneur books, but uh, there wasn't really a question on this one so much as we wanted to call it out because of the title of our book, but for sure. Um, let's go to the definitions. So I love the definitions where you've come up with, you've come up with these four word definitions, one for marketing. So let's talk about the top end and then sales. And where I think this leads team is this leads to mindset. It makes it so much helpful for those who didn't grow up in sales or maybe those of us who, who didn't decide they wanted to be in professional sales when they were 10 years old. And by the way, that's 99.999% of anybody who's in professional right. sales today. So on the marketing front, forward definition, offer value, invite engagement. That's it. It doesn't sound so hard. Well, so, you know, marketing... So my first book was about marketing. My second book was about speaking as both a marketing tool and a sales tool. And then this book obviously has the sales focus. So people aren't really, they're not afraid of marketing. They're not, uh, they might not understand it. They might not do it well. They might think that it's pitchy and it's like, buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. Uh, the sales part, which obviously you're an expert in, um, that's what, that's where the fear comes in, right? Don't want to be salesy. Right. Don't want to be pushy. There's a whole population of entrepreneurs that are sales averse, which is why your book is so important. But from a Thank marketing you. standpoint, when people say, I'm hesitant to market my stuff, I don't want to be always talking about me and my offers and my services and my programs and my products, because that gets old. And I would agree with you, that does get old and it doesn't work. So offer value, invite engagement is about how to be radically generous and radically helpful, provide content that people will benefit from even if they never buy from you. Right. So is your marketing content, and I mean your social posts, I mean your newsletters, I mean you know the your LinkedIn, uh, your LinkedIn profile, your LinkedIn posts, all of those things, can people extract value from them? So when you read Mark's book, when you read Mark's LinkedIn, when you read the articles, when you watch the YouTube channel, are you saying to yourself, wow, this is so valuable. Imagine yeah. if I became a client, right? So that's offer value, like put the goods out there in the marketplace. A lot of folks are afraid of doing that because like, oh, that's my stuff. And if I give this away, they're not going to hire me. If you don't give it away, then there's absolutely no way they're going to hire you. If you give it away, a small teeny tiny percentage are going to be able to run with the ball and get some sort of initial result. But no way are they going to get the massive transformational results of the clients who hire you. So that's part one is offer value. Invite engagement and I hear this a lot from clients and, and from even friends who say, David, I've been sending a weekly newsletter for 17 years and it's never given me a shred of business. David, I post the one minute video on LinkedIn every single morning for the last two years and it's never brought me a shred of business. And I look at these newsletters and I watch these videos and I say, well, there's no invitation. There's mm. no next step. There's no like, comment, subscribe, opt in, book a call, you know? And so the call to action, the invitation to participate further, the invitation is also not buy my stuff, buy my stuff, hire me, hire me, hire me. Right. The invitation could be super simple. Like, hey gang, can I get an amen? It's like, amen, right. amen, amen, amen. Okay, right, easy, light. Um, so, you know, comment, like, those are the easy ones a little bit more involvement, a little bit more engagement. Hey, you want to download this thing? Are you willing to trade your email address for a free PDF, video training, mini course, whatever it is? That's yeah. level two, right? A little bit more of a commitment because you know that you're opting into their world. And then level three is, hey, if you think this might be helpful to you, let's book a chat. Let's discuss where you're at. And, you know, if we can help you, great. And if not, we'll point you in the right direction and no harm, no foul. 
So, but when I look at these 17 years of email newsletters and there's not a single invitation to take a next step, right? you know, you people are lazy, busy, and befuddled. All the folks that are listening that are saying, oh, well, they know the next step. They could just have replied to that email. They could have just called my phone number that's right there on my website. They could have, but because they're lazy, busy, and befuddled, you don't tell them exactly what to do. Inertia is going to take them off into something else. They're going to click off. They're going to scroll by. They're going to delete that email and say, hey, you know, this guy, Bob Jones, he has a really amazing email newsletter. And yes. they might even be hiring someone else because they don't know all the things that you do. And then how many times have we gone to a prospect or even a new client and the client hires you for something and you found out that last year or you know whenever it was, they hired someone else that does something that you do, but the client never knew that you did. Oh, Mark, right. I wish I knew that you did sales assessments. Right. Mark, I, I wish I knew that you did sales kickoff meetings. We hired this other person to do our sales kickoff, and it was very, very disappointing. I wish we knew that you were a speaker. Well, of course right. you're a speaker. But again, if there's no invitation, right, at the bottom of the email newsletter, for example, hire Mark for your next sales meeting, sales conference, or sales kickoff. Here's the info packet. Put that in there so that you're not trusting people to use their own initiative. You're giving them a very clear next step in how to engage with you. That's an invitation. Bravo. So, so first of all, I just love, again, th that the focus on those four words, obviously, this is something that you refined over years, but it's so powerful. And it, it's funny, I, I couldn't help but smiling when you were talking about that, David, because we do so many things where we're training big groups of people. And, and it's hard for people to, to process the fact that they may have explained to the community, to a client, to a prospect, exactly what their business did. And they have a hard time understanding Herman Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve, which says, and now we're after the meeting, that person forgot between 50 and 75% of everything you said. A month from now, it's 90 to 95%. And people go, what do you mean? You know, it, it, it seems so difficult. But I, I think one of the things that's really been helpful for me, become, going from the corporate world to becoming an entrepreneur 10 years ago, I am so befuddled by so many things that are on my radar of things that I want to do with the business, that these things that are passing ideas in the night, they just come and then they go. But every day I can only get through the three things that are most important for our business. And, and so this idea of staying front of mind, the, the number of times somebody engages us and we end up into this conversation. And as we get through the conversation, they go, I've been following you for five years. And you go, what? Y you know, for five years, didn't you think to, to trigger a conversation four years ago? Because we do have those calls to action, but they don't. You know, yeah. they want to get a little familiar with you. They, they want to make sure there's some value in what you share. Yeah. And, 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 and it's on their time frame and so on and so forth. So it, it's such a helpful point and such a beautiful definition, by the way. Let me just so do a public service announcement right here, right now, Mark. Listen, folks, if you've been following Mark Cox for just the <laughs> last three to six months, you know he's the real deal. Get on his calendar, pick up the phone, reply to the email, comment on the podcast. Three to six months is all you need for Mark Cox. You don't need five years to wait. So, so David, remember at the beginning you said, hey, could you come on more often? You're going to be on every second week now. There you go. If, you're, if nice. you're open to doing that in that voice, by the way, you're, you're on every second week. You're, let, let's do the podcast together. Just clip that out and use it as a commercial. And now a word from David Newman. Fantastic. We're absolute. Sandra, <laughs> we're doing that. So marketing, the four words for marketing offer value invite engagement, yes. double, double click value. Yeah. The definition, the forward definition for selling, send invitation, spark a conversation. Yes. Genius. Yeah. Conversation. What do you mean by a conversation? So one of our mantras that I think shows up somewhere in the book as well is nothing good happens outside of a conversation. You can send emails till you're blue in the face. You can post on social media. 
You can you can even send cookies. You can send cookies in the mail. You can send amazing, you know, <laughs> $50 pens to an executive that you want to have a conversation with. None of that matters until we are voice to voice, screen to screen, or face to face. And this is an area where, again, the sales averse folks, this is the part that terrifies them. It's like, yes. Mark, what happens when the dog catches the car? I got yeah. a, I got a call on Tuesday. The guy replied to me. He wants to have a call with me on Tuesday. And then their heads explode. It's like, well, everything, everything that we do in marketing and everything we do in the front end of sales, like prospecting, lead generation, outreach, is designed to bring you into that first conversation. Yes. yes. Right? So people have this like, oh my God, this is a huge pressure moment. I got to sell. I got to pitch. I got to, I got to blast them with my amazingness and nothing could be further from the truth. That's right. So no matter what business you're in, you could be selling products, you could be selling services, you could be selling your expertise. The framework that I recommend that you hold this initial conversation in, and there's a lot of, like you said, Mark, guides, frameworks, language that you can use in this first contact meeting. But think of it as you're already hired. They're already a client. You got nothing to hide, nothing to prove. And so the way that I actually open these conversations is, hey, Mark, great to speak with you. Let me ask you, do you mind if I treat you like a fee paid client yeah, during it. this call? And then people will say, oh man, that would be great. You can even see their body language change. Sometimes they go, well, exactly what does that mean? And I'll say, oh, I'm glad you asked. It means a couple of things. Number one, it means that I want to make sure that we absolutely maximize the value of our time together for you, which also means that I'm going to ask your permission to productively interrupt and productively redirect if I feel our conversation is going off track, which I would do with Great. a paying client. Yeah. And then number three, uh, there may be some things that you share with me, and I'm just going to tell you the honest truth. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear, not necessarily what you want to hear about you, your company, your team, your whatever. Do I have your permission to do that? They say, yes, great. Now, they're already in the house. They're already in the family. All yeah. the pressure that's on you as a seller has gone away. So now you can start doing your initial diagnosis. What's been going on? What prompted you to book this call right now? What's yeah. wrong with your leadership, sales team, technology, innovation, whatever it is that we're helping them with? Um, how long has that been a problem? What do you think that's costing you in terms of time, dollars, hours, profit, percentages, rework, wasted time, wasted effort, right? And Fantastic. so now we're in a conversation. So look at look at every prospect as they're already a client and they just don't know it yet or they haven't signed off on the paperwork yet. Love it. And the more that you treat prospects like clients, the more clients you will get. Well, bravo. By the way, this is team. This is uh, tip number 29, five tips for the uh, for first contact calls. Five yeah. tips for first contact calls. First one, a great opening question. The second one, um, do you mind if I treat you like a feed paid client? And and it's the exact same script that, that David just went through, which is so powerful. And frankly, I think this is kind of the dirty little secret that um, trainers, consultants, um, anybody in professional services, lawyers, engineers, consultants, they don't know. And the truth of it is, this is the easiest part of the conversation because all you're doing is pulling information from them yeah. with amazing questions that get them trying to paint this better future for themselves. And they're emotionally connecting to either the pain they're in or the better future. But you're just sitting back asking questions. Yeah. I actually, my belief is most, most of the folks, and we get a lot of these folks like lawyers, um, financial professionals, consultants, their, their, their concern is they think they need to pitch. And so that, well, we're going to get the PowerPoint. And, and my rule of thumb is don't ever open PowerPoint again in a conversation. It will kill your conversation. Yeah. And so, so don't go anywhere near a demo. Don't go anywhere near PowerPoint. Just have a conversation. Yeah. And, and the easiest one in the world, folks listening is, hey, first of all, thank you so much 
for for setting up time with me. I'm so delighted to chat with you today. Um, by the way, I took a look at your website. It looks like you've been growing. Congrats with the acquisition. I'm really excited to hear about that. And, and on LinkedIn, it looks like you've got 125 employees, but you get seven open job postings. So things are moving in the right direction. I'm excited to hear all of it, but what prompted you to reach out to me today? You know, something so crazy easy and nice and open-ended, and now we can just sit back and have this conversation. Right. And, and, you know, it's, 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 um, you and I are having this conversation today. You've, you've packaged this up for your audience in a new way. We've been doing this for 10 years, packaging up, but team, the reality of it is this is what Dale Carnegie suggested we should be doing in about 1939. That's right. And, and so you'll love this, David. It, at one point in time, I had this, um, I wouldn't call it imposter syndrome, but it was perplexing me that we in our company hadn't come up with the brand new way of helping another human being that no one's ever thought of before that would be the magic potion that would completely change B2B selling. And it perplexed me so much that I, I went down to see one of our friends is Frank Cespedes. So through this podcast, we got to know him from Harvard. He's written seven books or nine books on B2B selling. He's fantastic. He's, he's been teaching the sales program at Harvard for 30 years. Wow. And I had this conversation with him and I said, you know, I feel like an imposter at times because Frank, I've been doing this for 25 years. Nothing's changed. You know, this is what I was doing in 1995 yeah. to be successful. And he said, he brought up a great point. He said, listen, he said, um, he had just had this big group of super high-end entrepreneurs at, at, a, at a Harvard course. And he was having a conversation with them and it wasn't resonating. And he went back to some principles from In Search of Excellence, you know, back in 1992. And he said, this thing lit them all on fire. And he said, sometimes you've got to take these, these universal principles, but they need to be, they need to come out again in the voice of that generation for that particular group. Yeah. And, you know, all of this, I, there, there was a real theme of, um, there was a real theme of this in your book, David, where these, a lot of these are fundamental truths. Yeah. But, but the, the second thing that I thought was just so clear, I think you take it a level down because you make it very simple for somebody in professional services today to understand the concept, but then to immediately apply it. Yeah. And, um, team, the other thing I loved about, um, about, uh, very early in the book after about section one, David says, Let's take a pause. What have you done? with the information in the book so far, are you actually gonna make some behavioral changes here? Or are you just gonna read another book? What a great move, right? Yeah. Because I think to me that screamed right from the page, you actually want me to do better. Yeah. Not to sell another book or do another workshop or, you know, but, but, but you actually want to change someone's behavior. I, I bet you get a lot of feedback on that. You know, it's funny. The, so the whole do it concept, the whole do it, you know, get into action. It's all about implementation. Great ideas are a dime a dozen. You know, this is why there's a million weight loss books. This is why yeah. there's a million how to get rich <laughs> books. So key to weight loss, my friends, move more, eat less. Key to becoming a zillionaire, uh, spend less, earn more. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Spend less, save more, spend less, yeah. save more. This is not, there's a million personal finance books out there. The ideas are useless, right? Yeah. The implementation and the execution of the ideas, given the stage and phase of the business that you're running, given your market, given your audience, given your prospects that you're marketing and selling to, uh, you will know how to adapt these ideas to your own personality preferences and strengths. And by the way, same thing, Mark, in your book, right? We can just keep reading books till we're blue in the face and That's no one's right. going to sell any more of anything. But but I think it's it's about the implementation of the ideas. And, and sometimes we can be kind of relentless. So people will say, oh, Mark, I love your podcast. This podcast is amazing. I, I read your book three times through. I highlighted every other page. And you say, well, that's beautiful. Thank you for the kind compliments. 
I'm curious, how has listening to the podcast or reading the book impacted yeah. your sales results? And then they start looking at their shoes. Their yes. shoes start to get fascinating. Like they're looking <laughs> down and, well, uh, you know, I really, but it's, uh, I still love your ideas so much and you're such a rock star and you're so amazing. And, you know, you and I leave those conversations a little bit deflated because yes. we're not here to write books and, and, and publish podcasts. We're here to help people tap into their inner, you know, inner potential that for some reason has been blocked up until now because they're sales averse or they don't have the sales skills or the sales discipline or the sales conditioning that they need to reach their goals. So, you know, I, I love when people appreciate my ideas, but I love it more when they make money with them. Well, well you know, David, couldn't agree more. And, and just two stories. We, we end up with some of the clients we work with, we used to help them and teach them how to interview salespeople. Very tricky thing to do. For sure. You know, with one in three churn every year and 18 month, 10, year, 10 years and so forth. And what you'd hear in a lot of interviews with professional salespeople, you'd say, well, listen, is there any methodology that you follow or have you had any training before in your career? And they'll come back and say, well, you know, I read the Challenger sale, Matt Dixon and Brent Adamson, and we'll kind of go, fantastic. Love that book. We've had both of them on the podcast. What, what are you applying from that book? And then again, this is where the shoes get very attractive, right? So absolutely nothing like they've taken nothing from it. And so, so I, I love this idea of, of, you know, the clarity in your book where these things that these are, these are things people should be applying almost every day. And you talk about that. Yeah. One of the important things is it's got to be a habit. It's got to be something we think about and do every day. But, but um, we had another client who was one of our first clients ever from 10 years ago. And they used to just continue to send all their new salespeople to our training and their leaders would come to our training. And at one point in time, they brought us into their office to do some work. And we could still see these templates that, that we had given, but they were the 10-year-old templates from, from the early days, but they were still leveraging them. And we just felt so happy. And, you know, that, that they were trying to uh, operationalize and still get value from what we had done. And so we do it differently now when we're doing large group training. We'll do the training. But before we do the training, we define specific desired outcomes, metrics, and, and outcomes that we want three months after the training, six months after the training, 12 months after the training. And as part of the training, we regroup with the leadership team to track progress with senior management. So it kind of keeps the leadership team um, or the sales leadership team accountable to make yeah. sure we're, we're, we're executing on these things. And it, and it makes sure they just don't go through another sales kickoff where it was fun, but it didn't change any behavior. Right. So wanting to make that change so critical. I, I, I want to call out one other thing. Um, you know, we're not going to go through, of course, team 77 of these ideas, but a lot of these really stuck. And, and, you know, many of the people who are listening to this podcast are looking for something they can take away right away and apply yeah. tomorrow. Um, item number 58, four ways to create follow-up magic. Four ways to create follow-up magic. The number one need of most human beings outside of food and water and sustenance is to feel like they were heard. Number one, four ways to create follow-up magic. Always lead off with the prospect's comments from the previous call. Did you even hear what they were saying? Start there. It just sort of breaks the wall completely down. And again, this is all part of feeling like they're already doing business with you. Yeah. You, you know, one of the top sales minds out there, um, in our view, is a guy named Andy Paul. So, yes. you, you know, Andy and, and he's got his, uh, you know, he's probably into 1500 podcasts. He's spoken to everybody. But, but one of the phrases he loves to, to use, which we like, is the folks who win in a sales situation are the folks that the buyer believes understands them and their situation better than anybody else. So, so you get comfortable. It's not about prices you bring up or service features. Those things oftentimes don't even matter. But does this individual actually understand our world and what's important to us? And so, so they didn't just hear us, but they actually understand what we were saying. I love the easy one, ask follow-up questions to every statement they make. Who, what, how, why. 
the, these multipliers, keep them talking. Yes. Well, it's else, right? The who else, what else, how else, where else, why else? Like who else will notice these improvements? What else would be important to them? How else do you think you might benefit? Where else has this been a problem? And uh, all of those who, what, where, why else questions, that is where those are sales multipliers. Those are, are revenue multipliers because from the prospect, you're inviting them to share with you, what are the problem multipliers? Yes. So when you have problem multipliers from your client, you have sales multipliers for multiple different ways that you can help them solve those multiple problems. It's so true. And and sometimes people believe, hey, this is so self-evident, but oftentimes you'll ask a question like that of a senior executive and they haven't actually really thought about the answer until they say it out loud because you asked the question. That's right. But then it imprints and they emotionally tie to it. You know, you you ask a question, how big a priority for this is the firm? And then somebody comes back and goes, you know, it's an interesting question, but if we don't fix this revenue issue, frankly, I won't be in this chair 18 months from now. So this has got to be a top three. Wow, a top three. What are the other two out of interest? Okay, got it. Um, you know, what are the implications if we don't address this? Right? So, oh, okay. Well, I'm not actually going to have a job. So, so these are the things that actually, you know, sort of crystallize it in the mind of the buyer. And I love, I love a conversation, you know, in a follow-up call where if somebody comes back and goes, you know what, that's a really good question. That means we sort of did our job. And you talk about, you, you know, that in the first conversation, doing some myth busting, yeah. you know, really, really adding value. And you know, it's funny, as you say that, Mark, it occurs to me that even if we misread the situation badly and we ask a question about something that's really not important to them at all, and the executive comes back with, well, Mark, that's the least of our problems. Have the presence of mind to say, got it. Well, what 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 are the top three then? That's right. right. Said, that's yeah. the least of my, no, that's not, we, we don't care about that at all. That's the least of our problems. Awesome. What's, what's the top three in the most category? And have some fun with it. See, that's yeah. the other thing is I think, I think amateur sellers put so much pressure on themselves. Yes. They're so yes. serious. Whereas professional sellers like you and me, we like to have fun. We like That's to right. have fun. We like to make the prospect smile or maybe even sometimes laugh. We humanize the sales conversation with humor. And that makes selling so much more easy and so much more fun. That's what selling is. And by the way, the other thing is, you know, we were talking about dopamine at the beginning pretty familiar with dopamine. Yeah. So, so, so curiosity also triggers dopamine. Yeah. So, so when we're asking them those questions, this is why it's so easy. If you, if you do it this way and have this conversation, the whole conversation is about them, yeah. but to be authentically curious about the answers to the, there's, they're not just answers that are leading to my sales pitch, whatever it is. They're answers where I'm authentically curious about how to help this person get a better future. And as you pointed out at the beginning, David, you or I are pretty clear. If we can help them, wonderful. Yeah. But if we can't help them, but there's somebody else we know who could help them, we'll be the first to do that because we understand, you, you know, good things come when you, you take this kind of approach and your yes. intent comes across. So, a thousand so, percent, a thousand percent. I would say more so, even though you should totally read Mark's book and read my book if you want to. <laughs> More so than any David sales Cook. technique is your come from. And that's what you're talking about is your come from, your intention, your character. Uh, they can tell no matter what script or template or framework you use, they can tell if you've got the old sales breath or commission breath, whatever that yes. cliche is. Yes. And they can also tell when they're talking to someone who is genuinely curious genuinely there to help them and serve them and completely detached from the outcome. Yes, completely detached from the outcome. That's the other that's the other magnificent point I think for everybody listening to this today. Anybody in professional services, training, consulting, the, the idea is you're not trying to find another sales opportunity. You're having another conversation with the right actor for you, the right person you know, the ballerina, not the truck driver. Great analogy, another theater analogy. So so I'm having this conversation about helping them. 
It was a guy from Harvard, Dr. Nick Morgan. I think his book is called, Can You Hear Me? Apologies if I'm wrong. We'll correct it in the show notes. But he talked about, we can sense another human's intent with nonverbal cues in milliseconds. And so how we go into that kind of conversation, like today, when we got ready for this podcast, I've heard you on your podcasts, but but we met for the first time. I literally in minutes and after we have, you know, we just got on this Zoom call, I, I thought to myself, this is going to be super fun. This is going to be a great conversation. I already like David. Um, so there's these things that we can connect, you know, pretty quickly. So I, the truth of it is better for the, for the process, but it's also better for the individual because this is what you want to do with your life and your career. It's not about pitching. It's not about cajoling. I'm not trying to get one more you know, opportunity in the fun. I'm just trying to help another human being. Yeah. And what ends up happening is great things happen for everybody. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so David, we are absolutely um, going to chat again. Team, team, I've got to just call out the last thing I loved about that. Number 58, four ways to create follow-up magic. It's not a need or a pain until you hear it from them. So, so you think, hey, I think I know the reasons people engage in sales training. Maybe. I think I know the reasons people buy enterprise software that, that uh, you know, does financial reporting. Maybe. But it, it doesn't exist until they say the need or the pain or the opportunity. And by the way, the return on investment doesn't exist unless it's in their model with their metrics and, and hitting their goals, whether it's MPV or um, uh, what have you, MPV, yeah. payback, whatever you want to call it. Those things have to come from them. Yeah. And and so I love it. It's got to come from that. We had um, Tim Hughes is a great guy, wrote a fantastic book called Social Selling. But, but he used to sell large-scale enterprise software into massive retail in Europe, including Marks and Sp Spencer's, which is one of the largest retailers in the UK. Yeah. Every business case they write had to come back to how many more pairs of undergarments, because that's their number one category killer, do they actually sell because of this project? Nice. And so it was always that, you know, would this actually result in more undergarments being sold right. or, or not? Because that's the only metric we understand. Right. So we're going to, David, a couple of things here, first of all. Um, first and foremost, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining the podcast here today. We're going to absolutely, if you're open to it, have you back for Do It Marketing when I read that book. That would be amazing. So so we'll get that on the radar. But for today, um, a lot of the folks listening today are going to really want to reach out and engage with you. So how who do we want? Who is that ideal client profile exactly for you? And how do they best make contact with you or learn more about you and your fantastic offering? Sure. Thank you for the question, Mark. So we work with professional services firm owners. So if you're in the business of selling your expertise, that usually takes the form of training company, consulting firm, coaching company, all B2B. So Mark and I are really kind of brothers from another mother. <laughs> and uh, as far as some resources, of course, we have our podcast called The Selling Show, which is at thesellingshow.com. And then some free resources on the main website, which is doitmarketing.com. There's a blog there. There is a free 37-page sales and marketing manifesto that's at doitmarketing.com slash manifesto. And then our free on-demand web training is at doitmarketing.com slash webinar. Amazing. And team, by the way, when you buy the book, Do It Selling, which you're going to buy, there's immediately you go onto an online um, um, system that's going to provide all the tools to execute on some of the core concepts in the book. Yeah. So, so you're going to just get your payback immediately from the book in terms of downloading this to these tools so you can apply these concepts to you and your business today. David, thanks again for joining the podcast. What a pleasure meeting you. Thank you, my friend. Same here. This is, uh, as they say, at the end of Casablanca, the beginning of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> and team, thank you so much for joining today. As you know, we run the Selling Well podcast 
because we want to improve the performance and professionalism of the world's most important business discipline. But in doing so, we believe we're improving the lives of professional salespeople everywhere. So thanks a lot for listening today. And we're growth oriented. So we know we can continue to elevate the way we run this podcast. So please keep your constructive criticism coming to us at Mark Cox at inthefunnel.com. Mark Cox at inthefunnel.com. That's my personal email. And we respond to every single person who gives us good ideas and keep them coming, by the way, because the good ideas, that's how we get great people like David. So thanks again, team. Everybody uh, continue to sell well. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time on the Selling Well podcast. Mm -hmm.